Wow, it's great to see so many folks here. I don't know about you all, I had a pretty inspirational day with all the conversations, uh, certainly starting out with uh, the conversation with Dr. Lanham this morning, uh, which is meant to be the theme of our um, conversation this afternoon for happy hour is um, kind of what you felt, what you took away, um, thoughts that it has spurred for you. I think at, at the outset there, after he read Reimagining Wilderness, the sort of pause um, that it, I hope it gave us to think about uh, what the future looks like for the National Wilderness Preservation System, what the future looks like for those of us who uh, either through vocation or avocation have made the care for that system a big chunk of our lives. Um, and seeing such great turnout, I am going to suggest that we start out with breaking into some smaller groups uh, because it'd be pretty hard uh, with 110 roughly here to have a meaningful conversation uh, with video and audio. So I am going to uh, create about 20 breakout rooms, which would break us down to about groups of five. Um, and I'm going to let that assign automatically and um, let you guys have a conversation and we'll pull everybody back and maybe I'll ask uh, somebody from each group uh, if you'll self-select to sort of do a quick report out. So uh, with that being said, going to send you to some breakout rooms and uh, can't wait to hear where the conversation goes. Folks are still making their way back from the breakout rooms and uh, get this larger conversation going here in a second. Oh, no, right. why is it not? I think we have everybody yeah. back. Um, and what I'd like to do is ask anybody who would be willing to raise their hand and maybe summarize what you heard in your room and uh, call on you that way. Anybody ready to give us a start? Hey, Bill, I'll go first. All right. Um, had a great group. Um, and just a couple of key takeaways. Um, lots of comments about just how powerful Dr. Lamb's poetry was and the readings from his book. Uh, I concur, just it's a, such a captivating way to, to start off a session like that. And he was, it was really great to hear. Um, just a, a general comment as well about it's great to see kind of a shift happening of integrating conservation. Um, into these conversations. Uh, you know, we know there's lots going on, bigger picture in the world, but bringing it to conservation, it's, uh, there was a lot of comments and that was a great um, connection that's being made and definitely a shift there. Um, and then the recognition that we, you know, there's a need for more equitable access and, in, and inclusion in the conservation world. And kind of, we tried to brainstorm a few ideas or at least uh, talk about some examples of what's happening. Uh, what's some actions we can do, which I think, you know, that kind of came up during Dr. Lanham's discussion as well and um, talked about a couple of things there. Uh, so yeah, it was it was a really good discussion. Thanks, John. Yes. That's great. Um, Rebecca uh, from the Eastern Band of the Cherokee. I just want to clarify, I'm not from the Eastern Band of the Cherokee. It's just the land uh, whose land I'm on. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, the more times their their um, name gets said, the better. 
Um, my, uh, not my, well, the group I was in um, had some really interesting conversations. We talked about um, kind of the work that we're doing and, and made some connections. Somebody knew somebody in the background of somebody's Zoom, so super cool. Um, but we also ended on a really interesting note, kind of just acknowledging the different barriers that a variety of groups, mostly minorities, um, um, like racial minorities, um, sexual identity minority, more minorities, sexual orientation minorities, things like that, um, face when trying to get into the outdoors. And that could be things like language barriers, economic barriers, um, financial support barriers, um, healthcare, lack of access to healthcare as a barrier and all of those things. And so when trying to connect with our communities and bring them into either our public lands, doing trips or helping volunteer, things like that, that it's not about, for example, just like printing a flyer in Spanish to be able to engage people who only speak Spanish or primarily speak Spanish, that they might be facing other economic issues um, in that area where they're from. So I thought that was super cool. Um, to, to recognize that and not as a as a pacifying thing, not as a, well, I guess, you know, if it's all systemic, then I don't know what we do, but as like, we do this and we also have to think about this and do things to, to help knock down all those barriers. So super cool conversation. Thanks, Rebecca, that's awesome. Peter Molly. Thanks, Bill. Uh, we had an, uh, an intimate gathering of uh, three people, which we, uh, we agreed was the bare minimum number of people to constitute a group. So we uh, we agreed just to echo what John Campbell had said that Dr. Lanham's presentation was very powerful. We also talked about sort of what else we thought we might remember from the day. And the other two people in the, the group mentioned that the I guess there were some there were some sessions that they attended that showed them a demonstration of some traditional skills that they currently don't have and that they're looking forward to learning those skills and even sharing the recorded sessions of those traditional skill sessions with their their trail crew uh, or their crew so i thought that was the ultimate measure of usefulness is if someone's going to use it again so i think those are the main takeaways great thanks peter i don't see any other hands but anybody else that just wants to speak up and share from your group just unmute yourself and uh, let her rip as they say hey bill um we were in the midst of me trying to find someone else to speak when we got called back so um i'll go ahead and do that um we um we had about five of us and had a good discussion about, you know, we had a few folks from the Southeast, um, a couple of us from Montana, and um, thinking about um, diverse, diversifying those who participate in activities on public lands and, and how that, that happens and what role we have in that. And, um, you know, we, we started chasing the, the need for education and what, I realized is that um, sometimes we as a community aren't aware of some of the um, things that are out there. And so we talked about uh, Wilderness Connect and the curriculum that was developed probably 10 years ago or so um, to bring to different um, teachers. You know, it was, it was based on um, helping teachers to meet their goals needed in the classroom, but also to bring some messages about public lands and wilderness there. But also had a discussion about even with that there, um, you know, uh, some school systems or teachers are just barely making it work for um, the, the things they're doing. And so to, to ask them to bring something new like that and to the school system can be um, challenging, but, but it's there. And so first step is for, for us as a community to um, become more aware of opportunities um, maybe even like be able to identify opportunities when they come up and think about how to make those connections um, um, in real time or and plan for them in the future. Um, and then, you know, we, we talked about 
you know, what toolboxes and other things are there for us to to like go down this journey that we're we're going down and and um, what the realization is that it's discussions like this that eventually help inform um, opportunities or policy or change. And so um, a part of the doing is having the discussion, um, albeit um, some of us are more ready to move past the discussion into activities than others. And so anyway, it was, it was a great discussion. Um, for a few of us who only just met and uh, didn't have any beers in our hand, um, it was good. All right, time for beers, even if it's only three o'clock here in Montana. Um, yeah, that's great, Jimmy. I think uh, I, I hopped in and out of a few sessions. And um, one thing that I think is universal is it, we're beyond the place for words and it's time for action. I'm, I'm referring back specifically to the conversation with, with Drew this morning. Um, and I'm also reminded of how analogies actually are a beautiful thing. And the idea that if you want a different sausage, you're gonna to have to put different ingredients in the sausage and how much richer our collective experience will be if we broaden who our community is, whether that's a community that values and loves wild places or our community of stewardship. Um, and that we're gonna to have to steward that community just like we steward the land um, in a way to have those richer experiences. So yeah, thanks for thanks for sharing that to me. And um, anybody else that wants to jump up and share what you heard in your room? Carol, I see you raising your we hand. Had a, we had a small group of young field folks that just got here. And um, one of the interesting things was um, we had a PAO who said she had learned all the history of wilderness, but the classes today really- I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play uh, acronym police on you. You had a what? A PAO? What's a PAO? Public Carol? affairs officer. Thank you. Which was very, <laughs> thank you, Bill, which was very interesting. And she was very, um, very appreciative of the wilderness management classes, understanding that she had learned that all in school, but understanding how to really engage in the conversations of Dr. Lanham this morning, the background of wilderness, and how to really talk to people about that better. She's very appreciative of that. And then the other conversation that I thought was interesting was, um, some of our field folks were, and this was not the first year they'd been here, but in different places, orientation included um, the native perspective of where they were, the tribe's perspective and how um, they had always been there. And um, one person said they could point to the line and they'd say, that's not a snow line up there, but that's a management line of where we used to burn for thousands and thousands of years. And talk about how carefully they harvested camas and things so that, you know, whether the management word is the right word or not, it, they were um, very interested in orientations that included what the prehistory and the history was before 1864 of those lands and what took place there. So um, a lot of interest there in that in that way of, of um, describing the wilderness areas where they work. It's awesome, Carol. Thanks. <clears throat> I know some of the conversations veered off of the conversation with Drew this morning. The one that I also heard was uh, that this has been a pretty good thing so far. I haven't heard anybody say that this virtual national um, wilderness skills institute um, is anything short of being a, a great thing. And, and even when we get to go back in person, the connectivity that comes from us all being together, um, that we have this community of practice that spread um, across, you know, spread across the country. I think it further enriches our community. So yeah, I do want to highlight a comment that was. Um, in the chat box from from culture who's literally here in the same building with me and she's been in a room with 15 uh, uh folks on her staff who've been watching this and a lot of the young ones somewhat relatively out of high school are wondering why a lot of what they learn today is not taught in school um today um and why they didn't learn some of the stuff that they learned whether that was from dr lanham or the public land session that the wilderness society did and so i'm curious what some of you all Think about how do we address that. Um, obviously, I know that that's a fraught conversation in America today, as some um, states and municipalities are taking actions to remove curriculum that they that they don't like um, and don't, that doesn't meet their worldview. But how do we how do we get that you know that actual representation of what our history is about? So, anybody else has uh, have some takeaways from their session or just from the whole day? I think we're at a point where we can sort of open it up. 
I think Bill, to, to answer that last question that you had, was just like, th there has to be inclusion in all spaces, not just the outdoor space. We have to focus on all spaces to, to get a full picture of, of um, the history the history of this country and 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 so you know i think it's um building a much more robust and inclusive society um and we're doing what we can and we're doing we're doing the work in our sphere of influence but yeah. um maybe we need to expand it you know yeah really are, are we at that are we at that inflection point where things are really going to change you know September 3rd, 1964 was an inflection point, but maybe we're more in a, in a period where um, we're going to see change, but I, I would remind us all that we have to become the change we want to see. So <clears throat> for sure. Thanks, Eric. Other comments, other report outs from groups? Feel free to unmute yourself. Um, I can go quick. Um, oh. I really enjoyed in my group because I've really been wanting to see more like indigenous visibility and see that history show up on maps and things because, you know, historically maps have been a really colonial way of um, sort of like controlling the land. So I think it's a really powerful and can also be really, you know, beautiful for interpretive stuff um, to make new maps. And so someone in my group was working on that right now to um, add different languages and stories and histories of the land to the maps that they're using in that area. So I thought that was really cool. Thanks for that, Kelly. That's, that is really cool. You know, I always think about, it's just a line on a map, but your, your group is absolutely right. Using a line on a map became a, a source of power, right? In the South and a source of uh, seg seg uh, I'm going to butcher the word, but, you know, subjugation. There we go. Um, and so now let's use the map as a tool for good, right? Let's tell the, the full history. Let's tell the history that maybe we don't know. Uh, certainly, we do live in, in an era when we have two technology like GIS at our fingertips that allow us to do that and use, use cartography uh, to tell that story, not for a, a way to exert power. So that's a great. Great report. Thanks, Kelly. Who else? Still got a bit of time. Hey, Bill, Pete Urban. I just oh, uh, share, thank God for plenary sessions because the hardest part of the day today was choosing from among four great uh, non plenary sessions in every time slot. So uh, you know, sure enjoyed uh, Dr. Drew every time I listened to him. Um, it's new, it's exciting, and it's challenging. And uh, the only regret so far is not being able to get to three out of the four sessions I had circled uh, in between plenaries. Well, not to fear, they've all been recorded, so you can extend your experience by watching the ones you missed already. So, yeah, and and I guess one of the advantages to being in the Eastern Time Zone is it's definitely too late for coffee, so it's beverage hour. <laughs> Good for you, Pete. If I was only there to have uh, have a Deschutes beer with you, that would be great. So. Yeah, first of all, first of all. <laughs> Who else? Hey, Bill, this is Christina Boston. Hey, Christina. I had a, hey, we had a small group, about five of us, um, representing a couple of us from California and New Mexico, um, Bridger Teton, uh, did I forget any? Anyway, um, mostly West group, but um, and we talked about some of the things that have already been mentioned and there were some good examples shown about um, working with diverse youth, youth and getting them experiences. And then kind of a follow-up to that though was <clears throat> just the frustration with, you know, we've got some great ways that we're engaging um, diverse youth, but then we don't have the jobs to move them into. There's just not enough jobs in the agencies. And, and so we generate this interest and this excitement, but um, don't have places to 
to, to sh shuffle that energy into in, in jobs. So that was part of our conversation. Then another part of the conversation I don't think has been mentioned yet is, you know, a lot of, I mentioned with our regional forest service, regional program managers, Washington office group, you know, we've been doing a lot of just listening and um, learning and um, taking stuff in, but now we're kind of at a point where, you know, what do we do with that? What, what are some real concrete actions we can start to take now to improve this situation? <clears throat> and um, looking at both, um, you know, internally with our own staff and, and um, systemically, um, and also with visitation. But, um, a, a part of that listening is the, the language we, we use, what we hear people, what they want us to use. Um, and that came up a little bit in our conversation when um, the term Latinx was used. And, and I mentioned that um, there's some people I know who are Latino and they really hate that term. And then there are other people who really think it's important to use that term. The people that don't like it think it doesn't sound like the Spanish language and is not you know, a good word. <clears throat> so um, I think the takeaway for me as we're doing this listening and learning and growth is these groups aren't uniform necessarily in you know, what we're gonna hear back from them about what's important to them, what language they, you know, resonates with them and, and that kind of stuff. So um, I think um, we need to be careful not to sort of try to start categorizing things too much within certain groups um, as we have these conversations and, and recognize that there's diversity within the diverse groups in terms of opinions and desired language and um, fears and interests and what they want. Well, it sounds like y'all had, which sounds like you had a very rich discussion. Um, that's great. Did, did I hear somebody else wanted to jump in? I, your Christina, your report about the Latinx versus Latino Latina thing um, does remind me that sometimes uh, there is a fear out there, though of saying the wrong thing when you're trying to do the work that you're afraid that you're going to say things the wrong is it wrong to say underserved communities or underrepresented communities or in this case latinx versus latino latina um but i think probably most people would say if you're trying to do the work that's a good thing right and we can learn together but i agree with the idea of let's not make broad generalizations that uh that certain cultures uh, that we don't fully know and understand would look at things in a way that we just assume. So um, that's, thanks for that report out, that's fantastic. Other think, comments, other reports? Scotty B. When we're engaging with um, these groups of folks that we need to step back, take a beat, in their space and ask them, you know, each individual group, how do they, how do they wish to be, you know, referred as, do we, you know, what, what terminology do we use with them? What kind of common terminology do we have with them? And how do we engage them in their space rather than trying to get them to come to our space? Um, you know, there's a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, stoppages there when folks don't feel safe coming into these spaces and I think that um, that uh, Drew really highlights that with his work that he's doing and it and you know it's got me thinking that and and I mentioned this in our group is that you know we're stewards of, of the of public lands but in reality we are also stewards of people and to become stewards of people we have to meet them on their own terms and ask them what it is that we can do that will facilitate them to have a better experience in life, in the world around them, in their space. And then once we get to know them and they get to know us, then we can engage them and then invite them into our space. But we have to meet them on their terms first and understanding um, where they're coming from, um, what they're, uh, you know, what it, whatever it is that's stopping them from engaging in the world or engaging in in society or engaging in public lands, we have to be the ones that step forward and steward them and become stewards of them and then invite them in. 
Uh, yes, 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 a thousand times yes, Scotty, it's absolutely true. And I, I would also add, and I think I said this this morning in the conversation with Drew, sometimes we need to go to their table without ever having the intent that we want to bring them to our table. Uh, I think all, all of us, and in, the, in those of us in the partner nonprofit world should build systemically into our structure, providing our employees the space to go do other service work. We tend to be all consuming in, in what we do for public lands, but providing the space to go um, serve other people without, without the mission always being about, well, then how do we get to then bring them back to be a part of our public lands, but just go be of service to others, I think is, um, so thanks for sharing that, Scotty, that's great. And damn good to see you, my friend. Who else wants to jump up there? I'm looking through the chat too. Um, you know, it's being pointed out that a lot of people are wanting to hang on to some of the conversations from today. Um, there will be some sessions on Friday where we're gonna talk about uh, what our takeaways are and what we learned. Um, the core team is gonna be meeting every uh, evening this week to, to think about how we're gonna kind of find a process to um, sort of crystallize all this information. Um, and in some cases, I think you all are wanting literal translations from what you heard today. And um, we'll continue to work on the processes. And I uh, appreciate your all's patience with us as we fight our way through the first year of doing something like this. Anybody else from the core team want to jump up with the uh, takeaway? Sure, I'll jump in, Bill, Nancy. Um, yeah, there was there was a lot of conversation that really echoed what um, others have said here. Um, that you know our our morning sessions were really powerful and really um, helping people get a deeper understanding of of this topic and how it relates to wilderness. Um, one of the things I wanted to uh, mention was that there was a really nice comment um, to the planning team on how professional this has been. And uh, they were the person who spoke up was really impressed by the program and just how things were started off today. And um, then just the, the professionalism and the knowledge of the presenters. So I wanted to pass that along because there's a lot of people that have put a lot of time and effort into this and everyone deserves um, that, that praise. I really appreciated that comment. Yeah, that feedback is great. It's, it's not been an insignificant amount of our calendars for the last few months, but it's also been an amazing group of people to work with, um, too. So, um, and that that is going to be one of my biggest takeaways is the chance to to work with old friends and new friends on the team. So, who else wants to jump in there? I will tell you uh, from my perspective, um, this community amazes me. Um, Drew talked about getting emotional while in the wilderness. Um, I got emotional this morning watching the 300 names go by the chat room and where everybody was from um, and knowing that people were taking time out of what I'm sure are incredibly busy schedules, busy lives uh, to participate in the whole National Water Skills Institute to participate in the conversation with Dr. Lanham this morning. And that, that is why I have an extreme amount of hope for the future for those of us who um, have such deep passion for the National Water Preservation System that, that there's a lot of us that are going to show up to do the work. And we're going to do the work on realizing that, yeah, our work goes well beyond the boundaries. It goes beyond the trail work. It goes beyond the monitoring work uh, to the to the removal of barriers, um, to the intentional actions of inclusion, to the efforts towards equity. I think uh, knowing that all of you guys are here um, really made my heart sing this morning. And so uh, I, I don't wanna speak for the whole core team, but I think I can in saying it's just, we're really grateful that there's so much passion that, that what we were able to pull together is something that spoke to you all enough that you would take time to participate in as little or as much as you can. So <clears throat> any final thoughts in the couple of minutes we have left? Anybody else want to jump in there? Well, 
Well, I will, oh, looks like we had one, Elizabeth. One, I, I just wanted to say, even though I don't have my picture up there, because I don't have the beautiful backgrounds that everybody else has. So I was like, I'm so boring compared to the every, where everybody seems to be. Now, it may not be reality, but it sure is gorgeous. So I tried to put a background on mine, and I still got my plain old blank wall in my bedroom. But thank you very much for sharing all the scenery all over the United States. <laughs> what a uh, what a great way to end, Elizabeth. That's fantastic. And um, and even without the uh, beautiful background, I think we all add another pixel of color to this uh, to this gathering of people. So, uh, Elizabeth, thank you for being a part of the picture that is this group. And uh, and thanks for ending us on such a high note.